Hi, this is Trevor and Nicholas from Become the Lion, and today on the show, we have James Nolan. James is CEO at Excel Global Partners and the EGP family of companies. He's also, also author of the book, The Purposeful Millionaire, set to come out on April 25th. James is also a keynote speaker and coach. James, welcome to Become the Lion. Thank you for having me. And James, for our audience out there who might not know you, do you mind giving them a little bit of context on how you got started as an entrepreneur? So how I got started as an entrepreneur is that I was a corporate attorney uh, who was pretty miserable in his practice and decided to leave his practice and start his own firm. You know, all of this happened during the midst of the Great Recession, unfortunately. So I got out there and uh, I had some friends who lost their houses and declared bankruptcy. And for me, I didn't have any clients. I didn't have any money coming in. So I had the daylight scared out of me. And starting my firm really made me tougher, wiser, stronger, and more fiscally conservative. But the main thing was I put, I, I took the first step, and the rest is history 11 years later. Hmm. What was that like, you know, starting up the practice when you didn't have any money coming in? Oh, my gosh. It was really, really frightening. And I'll tell you, you know, um, I, I left a corporate attorney practice where I had been making way into the six figures. I think I'd started out making hundred and thirty or hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year or something like that at the age of 26 and this was back in 2007 and I was the first in my family to actually um, achieve that level of uh, financial income and overall career success so I thought well the world is looking at me and I am supposed to be happy right now and I'm supposed to be this model of success but I didn't feel successful and I didn't feel happy um, but I had to do some reevaluating within myself to really figure out what I wanted in life and um, fortunately for me uh, I was uh, in a position where I knew that because of my life circumstances that if I thought about it prayed about it and worked towards something everything was going to be okay now, when I started my firm, um, the uh, sky had not fallen by then in terms of the economy, but several months later, the economy just was in shambles, and it just, it, it really, really frightened me, um, and I just didn't know what to do, but I'll tell you, one day I was sitting in my office, and I, I said, uh, I don't have any income coming in, I'm in a really tough financial position, and I've started this firm, why in the world did I do this? Um, and I looked back on it, and I had some regrets. And then I just started saying, if I don't get tough and if I don't find a client, I'm going to lose everything because I had law school debt. Prior to law school, I had gone to medical school for a year and then I had four years of undergrad debt and I had started buying things to look like and act like a successful corporate mm -hmm. attorney. So I had all those bills and uh, uh, expenses coming in and I picked up the phone one day. Uh, and I started cold calling companies because I said, you know what, when some companies are doing poorly in the economy, other companies are doing well. I cold called a company at about 6.30 in the evening and it bypassed the switchboard and fortunately the person who picked up the phone was the chief executive <laughs> officer. So I thought, wow, this is a huge company. That was a... Uh, uh, quite a, there was quite a bit of luck there that the that the switchboard was bypassed and it went straight to the to the C suite, um, and so I talked to this gentleman who was much older than I. He was the head of a very large family owned business, and I was very nervous at first with sweaty palms and sweat on my forehead and stuttering as I talked to him. But eventually I breathed and I relaxed, and I found some common ground with him in talking about what I wanted to achieve. Uh, as the head of this new firm, Excel Global Partners. I said, well, sir, we're a corporate consulting firm. Our value proposition is that we put on our, uh, put on our uh, gloves and we roll up our sleeves and we get in and we uh, not only uh, talk about strategy, but we talk about implementation too, and we do it. And so we are perfectly geared to assist your company in improving its financial and operational performance if you just give me a chance. And lo and behold, this gentleman, uh, talked back to me and said, I'll give you a try. And I was shocked and I didn't know what to do. And that was my first client. And so uh, I did a strategic plan for the company. I was supported by my life partner at the time who, who um, has become the chief operating officer uh, of my company, did a knockout job. 
And after we completed the uh, the project a few months later, we got a check in the mail for $45,000 saying, congratulations, good job. And that was the genesis during the Great Recession. And let me tell you, I took that $45,000 and stretched it and multiplied it and multiplied it and multiplied it. <laughs> you know, you talk about all this stuff that happened. And I really, I just love everything you just said. And there's a few points I want to touch on for our audience. And, you know, you're working this job as a corporate attorney you know, you're having the safe income coming in and then you decide that you want to start your own practice. What was, what did, did your friends and family say anything? Did you ever, you know, they call you crazy? Like, how did you deal with all of that coming in while you're trying to, well, you didn't have any money and you're still trying to build a company, which is insanely hard within itself. Oh, everybody thought I was crazy. Um, they were like, well, what are you doing? You, you've gone to school for a total of eight years. So four years undergrad, one year medical school, three years of law school, and you've come out and you've got this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. But for me, it was not necessarily about the money. I wanted to be successful, but I've never really equated success with what my paycheck looked like, fortunately. I know that for a lot of, of men and women out there who are in the career uh, are on the career path, uh, the, the race is to get to the top and to get to uh, as much income as possible. And the ego is attached to that. So fortunately for me, um, I saw uh, a confidence in myself knowing that if I put my best foot forward, I would be okay. Now, that was prior to the Great Recession. The Great Recession totally humbled me and scared me. Um, but yeah, people thought I was crazy. Um, why are you leaving this firm? I was, uh, uh, my office was in this beautiful uh, class A tower and I was on, I think the 48th floor and I had this office that was floor to ceiling uh, glass and my secretary sat outside of my office and um, had a paralegal and I was working for uh, this uh, very senior partner who had this successful practice. But one of the things that nudged me out of the firm was the partner that I worked for. I felt like he did not respect me. And it wasn't um, my feeling that he was disrespecting me, but it was actually him saying that uh, he um, did not appreciate having an associate of color being assigned to him, as well as somebody who is openly gay. Now, this is back in 2007 when in the corporate world you were supposed to hide your identity. But I had come out in law school prior to that, and I said, you know what, if I'm going to give my best in any corporate setting, I can't spend half my energy faking who I am. Now, um, for me, it was about doing a great job, showing up professionally, um, uh, doing the best work possible for the firm and for the partner that I was working for. And I got complimented frequently on how smart I was and on the, on the kind of work product that I was putting out. But one day, one of the other senior partners overheard the partner that I worked for yelling at me. Um, and he came into my office, uh, that senior partner came into my office and he said, does your boss always talk to you that way? And I said, yes. And I looked down at my desk and I started crying and the senior partner walked over to me and he gave me a hug and he said, well, this has to end. I'm taking this to firm leadership because that's not what this firm stands for. Um, lo and behold, my self-esteem was destroyed by working in that kind of environment. My um, uh, physical well-being and spiritual well-being had hit rock bottom. I was plowing through it on a day-to-day -day basis. And when I saw people in the halls of the law firm, I was smiling. But before I would walk in on a daily basis, I was, I was vomiting in the parking lot because I was afraid of this man. And I asked myself, you know, I'm a country boy from the southern foothills of Virginia. Uh, is this what I have to deal with in terms of succeeding in life? And no one ahead of me uh, in my family or in my immediate circle had had um, become a corporate attorney working for one of the country's top law firms. So I thought, you know, maybe I just have to suck up and deal. But there was a real turning point that day when that uh, very senior partner uh, walked over and hugged me and said, this has to stop. I'm taking this to the firm's senior management. And with that, um, I went home and I did some reflection and some self-evaluation and realized how far down the path I had gone in terms of lacking self-love, in terms of being becoming an inauthentic person, in terms of hiding who I was uh, within the halls of that law firm and faking. And I put together a plan to get out of there. And the plan worked. I exited. Uh, the CEO of the firm invited me to stay. He said, you know what? I'm sorry. I'll have you reassigned to another partner. 
But I had gotten too deep into uh, the situation, and I said, um, I just cannot be treated that way, and I've got to move on. So I did that in my mid-20s, and I'm grateful that I had the confidence to do so. You were just talking about how you were lacking self-love, you're being inauthentic for yourself, and I noticed a little bit earlier in the interview, you mentioned how you are talking about success, and you were trying to, it seems like to me, trying to attain someone else's level of what it means to be successful. And do you think this is a lot of things that happen to people as they grow up, especially for an audience who is younger and they might be going through school and they might be going through college and they listen to other people without being who they truly are? The main thing is to be authentic. And so many of us get caught into the trap of what success looks like. We've got to really um, come up with the formula for ourselves to determine what success is for us. For some people, it's freedom to travel. For, for others, it's uh, freedom to spend time with family. For others, it's a lot of money and status and clout uh, in their respective industry. <clears throat> but um, f- fortunately for me, I didn't have the, the pressure of owing money to parents uh, because I had borrowed money from them. Um, I put my entire self through school and I've got the, you know, I had the uh, Sally Mae law school loans and, and undergrad and medical school loans to to reflect that. Um, but I put myself through school and I didn't have to answer to anybody. Uh, what I did um, or what was the trapping in my mind was that everybody was rooting for me in terms of becoming either a successful doctor or a successful lawyer. Now, I'd had the first disruption with walking away from medicine to start law. That had surprised a lot of people because I had done four years of undergrad and then I had gotten into medical school, which is no easy feat. Taking the MCAT and doing all that stuff and getting into medical school was a big deal. Now, in medical school, I actually had a full ride scholarship and I took out some loans to pay for my living expenses, but I had a full ride scholarship and they paid for my laptop computer as well. But I got there and I realized that my heart really wasn't in this, that I was not going to be an extraordinary doctor. I could be a decent doctor and I could be a good doctor, uh, a compassionate doctor who could put uh, who could pay the bills and, and put food on the table. But it was not my calling. So I had had that disruption before walking away from the law firm to find my calling as a chief executive officer and the owner of my own firm, which today has done work in more than 20 states uh, in the United States and, and in uh, more than 15 countries worldwide. So we've expanded We've grown and all that has come together because of vision, because of guts and because of um, execution, execution, which is the really, really, really hard part. And quite frankly, not giving a damn what others think about me. And that's so empowering Um, when people have their claws in you and they're telling you what you should do with your life instead of you sitting down in essential silence, determining which way your life should go. It's really hard to be happy then. My goal is to not only be a successful, wealthy man, but it it is to be a happy, fulfilled, great man who can live a powerful, epic life. And hopefully I'll live to be 100 years old. And when I'm on my my deathbed, I can look back and say, I made some tough choices. I made some good decisions. I defined myself for myself. And I did not allow others to define me for me. And therefore, I lived a very good life. What do you think stops people from, you know, I saw a stat the other day. It was like, it was a high number of the percentage of the people in the United States are depressed. And it was like almost 83% of the people hate the jobs that you're working for, that they're working at. What do you, why do you think so many people are unhappy and unfulfilled in their life? Well, I think they've got to find their dreams. And nobody really shows us how to um, crack the code of finding our dreams. And I talk about that in my book, The Purposeful Millionaire, which will be released on Tuesday, April 25th. Um, I provide 52 rules for creating a life of wealth and happiness now. And at the end of each chapter, I've got exercises to help one to um, build their subconscious in terms of where they would like to go in life and to achieve their dreams. Now, part of that is the book is broken down into four parts, which is the success formula. Idea plus plan plus execution equals success. And I teach people how much time they should be spending in each part of actually um, working on that formula. The idea, everybody's got ideas. There are a dime a dozen. You go to a party, people are talking about ideas. I've got a million ideas in my head, and I can certainly implement those ideas. I, I, I c- cannot implement those ideas because there's not enough time or resources. You've got to move from idea to the plan. 
Um, and planning does take a little bit more time. And I say, you know, planning should take about 9% of your time. The idea should take about 1% of your time. That's where you hash out the details. But some folks get stuck in analysis paralysis. Well, what if this or what if that? And they spend a lot more time there. And, and before you know it, they've spent years um, uh, creating this plan that, quite frankly, can never be perfect. Because when you get to the real important stage, which is execution, you've got to realize that that plan's got to be nimble. It's got to be flexible. It's got to be adjustable. Because when you're in the, that execution phase, you realize what's working and what's not working and what really needs to be tweaked. And um, you should spend about 90% of your time executing on the idea and on the plan. So idea plus plan plus execution equals success at the end of the day. Do you think people trying to be perfect or being scared of failure is stops them from going after the dreams or trying to accomplish what they truly want to do in their life? You know, I, I think there are two things going on with that. There is fear of failure and there's also fear of success. Now, in order to achieve great success, one must meditate on it, one must train his or her subconscious on that great success, and one must push away all doubt and all fear. If one is working on being perfect, then uh, that just takes way too much energy. And it also takes, uh, it also requires a person who's trying to be perfect to uh, 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 lose confidence and, and to, um, when, the, when the door is closed in the room and when the person is really at home with his subconscious, uh, they're eaten alive by all of the shenanigans that they're putting on by pretending to be perfect. Now, the best thing that I can recommend for folks is to read, read, read quality materials that teach one how to be a subject matter expert in the field of their calling. I call it RTFM, read the frickin' manual. Now, I know that this is an audio podcast and not a video podcast, um, but you've got my, you can see my library behind me and I've got thousands and thousands of books throughout my house. I read the freaking manual in order to become a subject matter expert in uh, uh, the practice areas within my firm. Um, and, and talking, we're, I'm talking about corporate strategy, management, consulting, that kind of thing. It takes time and investing in oneself to get to that subject matter expertise level where people can actually compensate you at a very high level for your expertise. That takes what Malcolm Gladwell uh, calls 10,000 hours in his book, The Tipping Point. It doesn't happen overnight. So looking at my experience as a 36 year old man, um, I am uh, I feel just as happy and excited about my goals and objectives as I was when I was 25, but I learned a lot and I was forgiving of myself and I did not try to be perfect uh, when I reached much higher success. Now, initially, I tried to be perfect because remember this, you know, I'm a person of color and also I'm a gay American. So I did not have perfect role models uh, who looked like me or, or who had the exact circumstances as me sitting at the boardroom table. So I had to figure out what worked for me. And part of that in the beginning was attempting to be perfect, but that weighed on me and it took too much energy out of me. And I found myself exhausted at the end of the day, you know, wearing the perfect suit, um, speaking with perfect diction, finding the perfect word, pretending to be happy every single day, or not having a negative response or expressing how I uh, truly felt about an issue where I should have been more constructive because I was trying to be so perfect and happy and live on a 10, on, 10 out of a 10 and manifest that to the world on a daily basis. Uh, we are not perfect. We're human beings and we have to forgive ourselves in order to be our best because mistakes will be making, particularly when you're taking risks. If you risk nothing, you gain nothing, but mistakes are made when you risk. And because I'm farther along in my journey today, um, I'm taking big risks all the time. I'm taking calculated risks now, which are backed by my experience and subject matter expertise, but it took time to reduce the failure rate of my risks. But one thing I know, number one, I'm not perfect. And number two, I'm still going to make some mistakes. I really like how you were talking a little bit about the <clears throat> subconscious mind. Do you think how can someone bring their subconscious mind and realize the thinking that it might have been programmed, you know, through the media, through friends, through family, and bring it into the conscious, into the conscious mind, so that way they'll be able to change it? Wow. Wow. Great question. For me, 
I learned early on that meditation was sitting on a rug or sitting on a pillow and closing my eyes and bringing an attention to the practice, but that didn't work for me. It just flat out didn't work for me. I am a type A person who's got a lot of energy, um, and I felt that I was creating judgment for myself because I was not able to meditate like Deepak Chopra or like Oprah or whoever uh, said that we were supposed to meditate in a certain way. For me, transforming the subconscious begins with a meditative practice. When I wake up in the morning, I do what I call gratitude sessions, and then I move into 20 minutes of yoga or into uh, body weight lifting air lifting exercises. While I'm doing um, those gratitude exercises and bringing intention to uh, my exercises in the morning, uh, I am meditating. And when I break a sweat, I'll bring a certain thought process. Well, uh, for example, today, my uh, uh, intention for today is radical expansion and focusing on the power of what my book will actually be when it's released on April 25th. That's what my intention is. Now, I had to forgive myself in saying that, um, well, I'm not meditating right if I'm not sitting on a pillow on the floor and closing my eyes and not moving. I meditate now and I transform my subconscious by closing my eyes when I'm doing yoga, by closing my eyes when I'm doing free body weight exercises and bringing that intention and meditating and focusing on a certain thought for the day. I get power from that. And those thoughts are positive thoughts that I repeat to myself again and again and again throughout the day. I'll give you another example. When I wake up in the morning, I begin my partnership, my new relationship with the universe. Uh, when I go to sleep at night, you know, it's, I'm focused on rejuvenation, sleeping, that kind of thing. But when I wake up in the morning, I begin my day with gratitude. I make my bed every single place I go, whether I'm in a hotel or at my home or whatever. It doesn't really matter if you have a housekeeper or whatever. Um, but, but when I'm making my bed, I'll say, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll introduce that chant into the universe and it opens my mind into a deeper state of gratitude and I'm be beginning the day on a note of grace and gratitude, which brings happiness and peace and joy to my day instead of rushing to brush my teeth or rushing to go to the gym or whatever. I make up the bed. I slow down my pace. I breathe. I inhale positive thoughts. I exhale any negative energy that might be in my body and I just chant thank you, thank you, thank you as I'm making up my bed. Do you, what you mentioned sounds to me like you're trying to really be present with where you are instead of focusing on the things that you might have to do later in the day or the things that you didn't get accomplished yesterday. You're just putting all your energy, you're putting into your focus right now so you can fully live in the moment? Absolutely. It is so hard to truly be in the moment. We've got these you know, smartphone devices and uh, 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 smart devices and, and laptops and people have access to us 24 hours a day, it's hard to turn it off. Now, by having the external universe constantly be in contact with us and touching base with us and texting us and sending us messages and Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff, we are wired. We are programmed to turn off the internal side of things. In order to achieve what I believe is a life of greatness, we've got to be able to turn off the external and turn on the internal. That means that we increase our self-awareness. We open our eyes to really what's going on within our body, within our mind, within our spirit. And it can be as simple as taking a day of the week. For me, it's Sunday uh, afternoons and evenings, putting my device on airplane mode, closing my laptop, putting it away from uh, any viewing distance within my home, and just focusing on what's going on within. And then I take that practice to a deeper level where I go into a room and I'll just close my eyes and I'll check in with James to find out what's really going on to wake up that self-awareness so that I can bring my personal best to the world. Because if I'm not working on James, if I'm not working on that self master, bringing my best to the world, those around me are not going to be receiving the best from me. And there's no way that I can elevate them on my journey on this path to success. So as James is better, he brings a better self to family life, business life, all those around him, and those situations around him get better as a result of that. I know you mentioned a couple of times, and I know I mentioned in the intro, but you're writing the book, The Purposeful Millionaire, which is coming out April 25th. But do you mind just telling our audience a little bit more about that and why you decided to write the book? 
It all started um, uh, from a lot of people just encouraging me at conferences to write a book. I was speaking on panels and speaking, and people said, well, you need to write a book. You've got such an interesting story. Write a book, write a book, write a book. And I heard it a lot. Um, and I've always dreamed of writing a book. And in fact, on April 25th, the goal that my publisher has is for us to be Amazon number one bestseller. Uh, so we are pushing and working really hard on the strategy behind the scenes to market the book and to get the word out and to get our lists and text list and email list and that kind of thing going. But what really encouraged me to write the book is that I knew that something more was going on in my life from uh, uh, the success that I've had. Um, and I'll share this with you. I've had enough suffering and enough success in life to know that I should be sharing this powerful message with the world. Because of that beautiful balance of suffering as well as success, uh, I am blessed with what I believe is the universe's teachings um, in terms of training a subconscious into a life of greatness. With that, I break the, the book down into 52 rules that I live by on a daily basis that can be learned by anybody, that can be absorbed into the subconscious and brought into life by anybody and put into practice for creating a life of wealth and happiness. For me, it's more than a book. It is a powerful memoir that says, well, if this country boy from Virginia can achieve this life of powerful happiness and wealth and prosperity and an abundance consciousness, then others can do it too. Now, I would be remiss if I did not share my formula with others. Looking back at my life, and you know, if I were 15-year-old James, looking at 36-year-old James now, I would say it's impossible what I've achieved. But I was given the right circumstances, and I responded to the circumstances in a way that taught me these powerful lessons about how to create this wonderful life and how to start with the subconscious. And that's what this is all about, training the subconscious to manifest itself so that we're executing upon those seeds that were that are within our brains to actually get to where we want and need to be in life to be our most extraordinary best. So this is my mission. My goal is to change the way that wealth is seen in this uh, country in terms of its access to all people. We can look at any uh, national election, whether it was the 2016 election or not. It didn't necessarily boil down to race or class. What it boiled down to was money and access to power. I'll, I'll repeat that. What it boiled down to was money and access to power. People are afraid. Black folks are afraid. White folks are afraid. Hispanic, brown, yellow. You know, everybody is afraid about what tomorrow can bring. For me, I am blessed in that I have benefited financially and I've also benefited spiritually from putting this formula into place where I don't have to be afraid. And I want that for other people where they can go to sleep at night knowing that they're not going to lose their house, knowing that uh, if they work 40 plus hours of a week, they're going to be able to put food on the table. Uh, I want to take the fear away from people because when we're in a state of fear, the emotional side of the brain is working and the rational side of the brain is not working. I want people to be able to succeed so that they can turn that emotional side off, focus on the rational side, and create the powerful uh, person that they were meant to be on this earth. James, I just want to say this interview has been excellent so far. And now we're going to enter the Lions round. Well, I'm just going to ask you a couple of quick questions before we end the show today. What would you say to someone who's just starting out and going after their dream? I would say to that person, don't compete, be unique. For me, everything boiled down to authenticity and learning to accept love and embrace who James Nallen really is. Uh, don't compete, be unique. It took me some time to get there. But once I got there, the world started rewarding me. Once I embraced a powerful partnership with the universe, the universe became my partner and it rose up and met me with every single goal that I have once I stopped looking at things in terms of competition and once I started accepting myself for who I am and building upon that, strengthening my strengths and focusing on who I am, loving myself, manifesting that love to the universe, 
benefited me in so many ways. And had I learned to not compete and to be unique earlier, I'd probably be a little bit farther along on my, on my journey today. Do you happen to have two or three books that you'd recommend for our audience to read? <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, I love Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power. Uh, in that book, I mean, he just breaks it down uh, in terms of how we should uh, manifest power and make decisions in our lives. Uh, I received the sage advice from someone when I started my business. Uh, do you want to be right or do you want to be rich? Now, in the executive consulting world that we play in in Excel Global Partners, it's important to provide the best solution for the client, not necessarily what I believe is the best solution. Uh, when I look at the 48 Laws of Power, it reminds me that you can bring your best to situations, but we've got to navigate these waters very, very cautiously to get um, to the end and to the other side. Uh, and it's about pushing the ego away to make sure that you understand what the other side is getting at, what their strategy is, and that you're listening to them. So the 48 Laws of Power has been very effective for me in terms of navigating uh, uh, situations in business and in my personal life. And knowing, too, that it's not always about winning. Number two is Wallace Waddles, The Science of Getting Rich. Now, Waddles breaks it down in his book, which is decades old, uh, how to create a, a subconscious of greatness how to train one's mind to think and to navigate situations to get to um, one's dream of being wealthy. That was the most powerful book that laid the foundation for me and, in my opinion, is the foundation upon which all of these other motivational books that talk about wealth creation and talk about abundance consciousness come from. So Waddles, The Science of Getting Rich, as well as Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power are uh, wonderful books that I sometimes even travel with because they, they've been so effective for me. And James, last question of the day. Where can our audience find you? The audience can find me at www.purposefulmillionaire.me or at jamesnowlin.com. That's J-A-M-E-S as in James and as in Nancy, O-W-L-I-N.com. They can find me also on all over social media. I'd, I'd love for people to join the Purposeful Millionaire Club where we're gonna send uh, motivational quotes, inspiration to people to ensure that they're staying on their path to becoming purposeful millionaires. Uh, we'll send that information out on a weekly basis. I want them to sign up. They can sign up at purposefulmillionaire.me or they can go to my Facebook page uh, and sign up there. Also, when the book comes out on April 25th, uh, the paperback version is $14.99, but if money is an issue, I am running a special where I am funding the launch of the ebook for 99 cents. It is that day only, 99 cents for the Purposeful Millionaire for the ebook on April 25th. That'll also help us to get our get to our goal of being number one bestseller on Amazon. So I don't want anybody to uh, look at this as being a financial hurdle of having to spend the money on the book or you know whatever. Just go to Amazon, click. 99 cents get the ebook that's the bare minimum i want people to have the paperback but after that the uh, ebook does increase in price i think we're uh increasing the price to 2.99 the following day and 3.99 after that but we've got to achieve uh that number one bestseller status on amazon we'll be giving away gift cards we'll be on facebook live on april 25th and we are creating a movement and opening the consciousness of so many people i'm so excited for the youth for the entrepreneurs for the business people who are ready for that radical transformation within them, themselves. And it's gonna start with the purposeful millionaire at the book with the 52 rules of creating a life of wealth and happiness now. James, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time today to speak with our audience. Thank you so much for having me.